Come here. Hello. Come here. The puppy is back. Grace. <laughs> no. Gracie. No. Come here. We're doing our best. We're still doing our best. Ben. Hello. Gracie. No barking. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Aloha at home. To Aloha still at home. Gracie was at the vet for a checkup last week. So last week was quiet. Today, this week might not be as quiet, but she is here. She's okay. It was just a checkup. It was, she's a year old, so she's a grown up now. Uh, thank you once again for being here with us. I'm really excited for today's conversation. Gracie is a Yorkie poo, someone just asked. I uh, get to talk to two different friends of mine. First off, my name is Jamie Tworkowski, and I am the founder of To Write Love on Her Arms. So I am here on behalf of our amazing team, on behalf of our staff, interns. We've got people spread out in a bunch of different states. Uh, most, most of our team is in Florida. I am in East Nashville here with Gracie. Uh, and we're going to be talking to my friend Megalyn at Chicken Woke, and she will be joining us from Los Angeles, and then also Carlos Whitaker, who lives here in Nashville as well, just a few miles away. So really excited to talk to these folks, both of whom are friends that I've been able to call friends for the last few years. Before we invite Megalyn on, I want to get to a few announcements. I am wearing our Run For It 5K shirt. Forward is forward, no matter the pace. And our Run For It 5K is coming up this Saturday, May 16th, and I've got some good news. We are right around $6,000 away from our fundraising goal. So we set a goal initially of raising $85,000 uh, to continue to fund the work that we do. Everything from delivering hope to people every single day, through our website, through social media, at events, when events can take place. Uh, and then also connecting people to professional help. We love that in addition to simply connecting people, we get to at times fund counseling and fund treatment. So we are 14 years into this mission, this conversation, and it's an honor to continue to get to do this work and to continue to help people, to continue to see lives change. And Run For It 5K has become not only one of our favorite events, but it's also become one of our biggest fundraising moments and campaigns throughout the year. And we, we were worried we'd have to cancel the whole thing. Obviously we had to cancel the physical gathering in Florida, but we were able to make it a virtual race. Uh, we were able to invite people to participate virtually, which simply means wherever you live, any state, any country. And so we will now have, we're closing in on 4,000 participants. So all 50 states will be represented, countries around the world. People are running, people are walking, people are doing a bit of both. People are pushing strollers, people are doing it in wheelchairs. It's not about how fast you are, it is simply about moving for things that matter. So whether that is for someone you have lost to suicide or to addiction, maybe it is running or participating on behalf of someone who's struggling, someone you care about, Maybe it's simply participating on behalf of your own story. Uh, we see so many different reasons and stories that, that get people out there to participate. And so that's coming up this Saturday. You can still order one of our packs to participate. It may not arrive in time, but honestly, we, we will still see people doing it next week. So if you can't do it Saturday, that's okay. Uh, the point is doing it. The point is supporting To Write Love and all of us being in it together. It's okay if you can't exactly do it on Saturday. So more information, runforit5k.com. Again, it's runforit5k.com. That's also the hashtag that we want to invite you not only to check out, but to uh, lend your voice to. So that's the hashtag we've used for years now. And, and we love seeing photos and captions from people all over who have participated in years prior and people who will be participating this weekend as well. Hi, Lindsay Kolsch. Uh, so that's Run For It 5K. We have a new podcast that is dropping this week. It may be dropping today. Lindsay, you can, you can uh, correct that or update that. 
But this one is with Tiana Soto, uh, and it has a great mindfulness practice that we are excited to share. And we're going to continue releasing new podcast episodes through the month of May. Uh, Obviously, May is Mental Health Awareness Month. And so we're doing a number of things. We, We launched a black and white merch collection that we're excited about, new podcast episodes, blog posts. So we are definitely embracing the month of May. Again, find more about that on our website, twiloha.com. We've also created a a landing page that really is specific to this moment in history, this pandemic moment that we find ourselves in. You, if you come to our site and you end up on our landing page, you'll find self-care ideas, uh, you'll find different practices, you'll find blog posts that we've picked out specifically for this moment. You'll even find coloring book pages that you can download and print out. Uh, And you will also find the ability to find help, to connect with mental health professionals. We want to remind people that's still an option, even in this difficult season, even in this season when so many businesses are closed, when so many things have been canceled. We want to remind people that you can still get help in this time. Uh, So please take advantage of our find help tool. Anyone in the U.S., you can simply enter your zip code and you can find local mental health resources, including free and reduced rate mental health services. You can also find solutions and resources related to COVID-19. So not only mental health, but you can find solutions related to food, related to housing. We know that there are so many different needs that people are living with right now. And so we we have been excited to be able to add and offer uh, COVID-19 resources. I wanna mention, if you have questions throughout the next hour, question for me, for our team, for Megalyn, for Carlos, you can submit that. Uh, there's a question mark icon at the bottom of your of your screen. My sister and Lindsay both pointed out uh, the podcast is out today. So the, the podcast episode that I mentioned is out today with Tiana. Uh, let's see, what else? Mental Health Awareness Month, AFSP is hosting a Twitter chat tomorrow. That is Wednesday, May 13th, 2 p.m. Eastern. And it will be to write love on our arms, AFSP, Crisis Text Line, the Jed Foundation, and the Human Rights Campaign. And you can follow along by the hashtag RealConvo. So hashtag RealConvo. And we are honored to be among that great list of organizations. Again, that is tomorrow, 2 p.m. Eastern, Wednesday, May 13th. And that is a Twitter chat hosted by AFSP that we will be participating in. Uh, The next time we're gonna do Twiloha at home will be a week from today. So we're not gonna do Thursday, we're gonna do next Tuesday, which is May 19th at the same time, 4 p.m. Eastern. And then I will actually be taking over Skull Candy's Instagram next Thursday, May 21st. It's not, it's tentative right now, but probably in the evening, probably around 7 p.m. Eastern. And we are honored to be one of the nonprofits that Skull Candy supports. We have partnered with them for their new Mood Boost campaign that we are so excited about. And I am going to be having a conversation with another nonprofit founder. I'm not going to give it away, but I'm excited that they invited me to represent the organization and to take over their Instagram next Thursday. And I think that's enough announcements. I am going to bring on my friend Megalyn. I saw her request. All right. She's coming on. Hi. Hi. Hello. It's your first time going live. Yep. Oh you, my God. You look awesome. There's 41 people watching. No, there's going to be more. There's already more. <laughs> Um, did I do it right? I'm sorry. I was, you were frozen for a long time. I'm sure you were saying all kinds of great things. No, no, you, you're doing great. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Is it really your first time going live? Yeah. Well, I've, I've never done this type of live, like a live conversation. I've never done the live with two people at the same time. I'm not, I'm not that. Yeah. Fancy with the tech, but, um, I mean, I've, I've, recorded live things like if i saw something cool i was like oh, i'm gonna put this live. one person saw it 
we're at home and so there are barking dogs at least at my house gracie no um i'm so excited to to have you will you tell people where you live where where you're joining us from um i am in echo park california do you claim echo park or los angeles or a bit of both echo park -y. come on yeah echo park is own part of los angeles i love that so how about we dive in is that cool yeah okay so you i've been i've been setting this up i've been telling friends that you have such a fascinating background your parents where you grew up um and maybe our our first segue you shared or actually you should not just with me but on your social media there is a documentary that i believe is on netflix right now that relates yeah. to how and where you grew up and I wonder if you could tell us about that and then to tell us about you. Sure. Um, okay. Yeah. There's this incredible documentary on Netflix called Basketball or Nothing. And it's about this high school basketball team called the Chinley Wildcats and their um, attempt to win the state championship. And it kind of follows them throughout, you know, the few months leading up to the championships and, and um and you all and throughout the the series it's a series it's six mm. parts and throughout it you kind of get a sense of what basketball means to the community and um and you get a sense of the culture the navajo culture and why and how they approach sports and um and and how they dedicate themselves in a way that's really inspiring so um, the reason why I love it so much is because that I grew up in Chinle, Arizona on the Navajo Reservation, and that was the basketball team that I played on. I played for the Chinle Wildcats, and um, we did not go to state when I was there, but um, we tried. And uh, I was actually, if, if I'm being honest, I'm more of a, a cross-country track person, and in cross-country, we did go to state, and we won five times in a row so what yeah the the navajo uh the navajo nation cross-country athletes are out of this world like they body anyone we always win state we're like the best so yeah just fyi but but um but i love that documentary because it's like i don't think that people really you don't really no, most people don't really know that much about the navajo nation or any reservations in the country for that matter and um and um uh, this team just had like so much heart and so much grit and um and also i think it's pertinent right now because of what's going on with the pandemic on the reservation um and and not just the navajo reservation the sioux reservation um and oklahoma they are getting screwed over once again i mean they're not they're not getting the aid that they need and the and the virus is hitting hard i think in the navajo nation um, they have the most cases per capita uh, mm. in the whole country. Uh, yeah. and that's that's in insane. That's an insane number. And I think um, largely due to the fact that they don't have the resources they need. They are they are underfunded. And you know, the 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 aid that they're supposed to be receiving, they haven't they haven't received, and they're told that they needed to wait longer. And meanwhile, people are dying, and they're. There's, I, I don't know if they're still under curfew, but um, they've really been going through it. And a lot of people don't, a lot of people still don't have running water or electricity. So the, the idea that they're supposed to um, isolate and wash their hands constantly is, I mean, that's a fantasy. They, 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 they aren't capable and um, they need a lot of help. So um, I encourage anyone who can definitely, um, definitely learn about what's going on and, and donate if you can. You just tweeted a link to a story, right? I did. Yeah. yeah. That was a new, that's a New York times article that came out yesterday. Just kind of like, I, I think a week ago, um, the Navajo nation was close to being, was one of the top three in terms of cases in the nation. And, and yesterday the New York Times confirmed it's that there are more cases per capita on the Navajo nation than anywhere in the country. And it's, I mean, there's not, it's not a lot of people there. It's, it's mm. a large reservation, but I mean, it's yeah, that's unacceptable. Oh, people are asking about the name of the doc. It's Basketball or Nothing, right? Basketball or Nothing, yeah, on Netflix. So 
we're gonna we'll touch on a few things, but will you talk about um, how how old were you when you lived there, and kind of what you what you remember now as an adult? Maybe whether it's good things, hard things. Um, I moved there when I was six years old, five or six years old. Um, and oh, what do I remember? I, I remember, well, first of all, it's like the most stunningly beautiful part of the desert that I to this day have ever seen. Um, I remember there's just so much wide open space and sunsets that look like that movie. Um, did anyone ever see that movie? Um, if Dreams May Come is it with, with, oh. with Cuba Gooding Jr. and um, Robin Williams, What Dreams May Come. And I've it was heard like, of it. It was like the, the world was like a technicolor. It was like this fantastical world that they were in. And, and that's when I think of the reservation and the landscape that I grew up around, I think of that. Um, and then also I, I remember the culture, like this incredible culture. And I, I'm not Navajo. I think people usually assume that I'm Navajo because I grew up there. And I think it's, it's safe to assume that if you grew up on the reservation, on the Navajo reservation, you're probably Navajo because yeah. it's a sovereign nation within the United States. And um, the only reason you would be there is if like you were a teacher or a teacher's kid or a doctor yeah. or a nurse's kid. And that's what I was, I'm a nurse's kid. And my mom worked for the Indian Health Service. Um, and so, and she found this like special place to raise us and we, and we stayed there. Um, mm. Yeah, I mean, but, but the culture is incredible. And um, I love the idea of people learning more about it through basketball or nothing, or just, you know, just read about it. I mean, there's just, there's just so much. Also, it's like an, ama an amazing tourist attraction. There's this canyon called Canyon de Shea. So people who travel through Arizona and maybe make their way to the Grand Canyon would stumble upon Canyon de Shea. And mm. so that's where I grew up. If you can, if you want yeah. to Google Canyon de Shea and see that beauty, that's where I grew up. Um, we're totally bouncing around, but I wonder at what point does some awareness of mental health enter your life, whether it's because of someone you care about or maybe it's out of your own experience, but I wonder when does mental health, whether you have the language or not, uh, when does that kind of show up on your radar? Mental health, um, that I think I definitely, um, it definitely sh showed up on my radar in a, in a more major way kind of in the last say 10 years or so. Um, I have a brother who struggles with mental illness and, um, and through um, trying to care for him have, have learned a lot about it. Um, and uh, and I and I realize now that there are lots. There's a lot to learn, and that there are a lot of people who struggle with mental illness, especially in in communities where they. Oh. Yeah, it just froze for a second. People who struggle <laughs> with mental health in communities, and then I, then you froze. Um, sorry, that was my, that was my timer. My social media oh, yeah. was up for the day. Can you do some more screen time? Yeah, I can. Okay. For you, I can. Um, yeah, so, you know, uh, I've learned that, especially in the black community, um, there are a lot of people struggling with mental illness and they don't, they don't get the, they don't get the care that they need. Um, largely in part because it's not really acceptable. It's not really talked about. Um, it's not really acknowledged. Um, and I would say similarly in, in the native communities as well, there's just not, um, there's just no, there's not really a precedent for it. And um, a lot of people struggle with it, especially when you think about like what the tribes have been through, you know, um, for generations. And that doesn't just go away because we live in 2020 and, and oh, okay, like, you know, they still, they live on reservations, you know, yeah. those, those are not, it's not that long ago that they had to live there. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, um, a mental illness has, has become mental health awareness has become a huge part of my life in the last few years. Yeah. Um, I want to get back to kind of your brother and what you've learned, but I wonder in this season that we all find ourselves in, um, where so many things are limited, what has your self care looked like and maybe what 
has prioritizing your mental health looked like? Oh, wow. Um, well, this time is for sure unprecedented. I mean, it's like you couldn't write this. Like, it's like we're living in a science fiction novel. So, um, yeah, I think right now I've just been trying to, I think it's important just to kind of go like, what really ask yourself what I've really been asking myself, what do I need? What do I not need in my life anymore? Um, and I mean, I, I, I can't really complain. I feel like I'm in a, in a pretty good spot and I'm really weirdly well equipped for this because I, and I think a lot of artists are because the artist's life is really unpredictable and mercurial and you kind of, especially an actor, you sort of don't really know what's going to happen. You're often in holding patterns. Um, and so I, I am familiar with, with this type of living. Yeah. So I feel lucky, but it's still really, really heavy. It's a really hard time and, and thinking about like what the future is going to be like. Um, so I, I mean, it might, it may sound cheesy, but I've just been trying to be present and trying to forgive myself for not accomplishing everything I want to do and understanding that I probably won't be able to become a, a professional ballerina and a pianist and um, write a novel and a screenplay and uh, become the president of the United States, you know, in a couple of weeks time, yeah. maybe a little longer. And I'm forgiving myself for, for not doing all those things. Are there any rhythms or sort of practices that have been that have felt good in the in recent weeks oh yeah i've been uh well i dance i'm a dancer too so i um and dance is kind of like my church especially um especially in t when i'm really not doing well i can always go to like exercise and you know i i did i used to run and i used to play basketball but you know the my adult life has been really about dance. And so mm -hmm. I have a studio that I dance at close by and obviously no one's going to the studio. So um, my studio has been offering classes online and Zoom classes. So I get to take class with my ballet teacher on Zoom every day if I want. Um, and then there's like, um, oh, he's actually becoming kind of famous. His name is Ryan Heffington. Yeah. From Sweat Spot. Okay. Um, the Sweat Spot is a dance studio here in, in Silver Lake. And um, he's been doing live uh, classes and it's kind of becoming like a sensation. Wow. So, yeah. So he's one of my teachers um, and all the teachers there are now offering classes online and that, I mean, I, if I can say one thing, I think, you know, moving your body and getting, getting the blood pumping has been, is always my saving grace, something I always go back to. Yeah. And also it, it literally scientifically can, it boosts your, it boosts your endorphins and, um, and I've, I've been prescribed 45 minutes a day of, of cardiovascular exercise for depression wow. uh, before in my life. And it really does help. So. Yeah. Um, I know that people watching this or people who might end up watching this, people can relate to having a family member, maybe having a friend that they love and they, they want to help, but they're not really sure how, you know, specific to mental health. Yeah. Certainly people can relate to having loved ones incarcerated um and and then i think what you've been learning and, and really advocating for is just kind of the intersection right of of mental health and the criminal justice system and i wonder maybe just if you could share a little bit of what you've learned and what you would want people to know uh yeah um i've learned a lot over the last few years um I think that, um, and I think a lot of people have experienced what I've experienced. I don't think that my my situation is is super unique, um, but I'm I get really you know I've been really upset about it, so I talk about it, um, which is has been helpful. Um, and there's a lot of people doing a lot of great work. So for instance, um, if you follow my, if you follow me on Instagram, you notice that I post a lot about reform LA jails, and that's something that. Um, in the midst of, you know, all the bad feelings around incarceration and, and how our country treats mentally ill people, how, how our country criminalizes mental illness, um, 
being able to advocate on behalf of organizations like that um, has been has been really healing. So so getting involved, um, and what Reform LA Jails does is actually they're a, they're a ballot initiative. So in in instead of um, I mean, there's all kinds of ways that you can be an activist, but I I found this one particularly inspiring because it's actually making a change, policy change um, yeah. within LA County and, and getting a ballot. We had a ballot measure on the last, um, in the primary election, and it was to get, um, to get this initiative passed and it did pass. Mm. And so now, now it's the law of the land and now the community now you and not you don't live here but like the community of los angeles los angeles voters have subpoena power and we can subpoena the the, the sheriff's department um and we can demand um uh civilian oversight and really see what's going on and say and, and have a stake in our community and say like that we we do not accept this you can't continue to criminalize people with mental illness um, and I guess I skipped over the part where, yeah, I, I have a brother who's been struggling with mental illness for, for years and he's been criminalized for it repeatedly. And it's been really hard to watch um, when you have a loved one who's, who you know needs help and, med and medication and who's like terrified for their life and they're incarcerated in LA County Jail um, and, and not getting the help they need and deteriorating and then trying to go and visit them and seeing seeing what's happening to seeing what happens to someone who needs um, who needs medication and, and therapy and is not getting and who's in, in, in an environment like that um, and often people with mental illness become um, they're subjected to solitary confinement for their own safety and I mean I think we all can understand how solitary confinement is the opposite of what yeah. someone with mental health issues needs. So, um, so yeah, I, I've been really pissed off. So that really, really my activism comes from anger and it just, I need, I need a way to, 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 um, to get it out. Yeah. Are there any other, will you mention um, the organization you touched on and any others that, could be good for folks to follow or learn from? Sorry, say it again. Just, uh, you, you mentioned the one organization that I know is in your Instagram bio, but just if there are any others you would recommend for people to follow. Oh yeah, I would say follow um, Dignity and Power Now, follow Justice LA, um, follow, um, oh God, there's so much. Um, uh, you know what? I can, I can make a whole list. Okay. Yeah, but those are those are a few. Um, say, I can't think of. Yeah, no, no, it's okay. Instagram handles. Yeah. Um, well, no, I even as your friend who follows you, I feel like I've learned a lot just from seeing what you've been sharing in recent months, which was part of why I wanted to talk to you. I wonder for you, have you found? friendship and support? Have you met some people? I could imagine it's, it's lonely at times for you as the sister who is heartbroken, who's angry about the state of things. I wonder if you've been able to meet like-minded people kind of as you've become an activist specific to this issue. Yeah, um, I have met a few people. I will say it definitely is lonely. It definitely is. Um, it's also not something that's really super easy to talk about. And unless you've experienced it, you, mm. you can't, re it's hard to relate. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like for instance, Patrice Colors, I would recommend following her because she's behind a lot of the activism in, in LA County. Um, and, and it's been really, really effective, mainly because, you know, LA County is, has the largest uh, jail population in, in the country. Mm. Um, and we criminalize, you know, we criminalize mentally ill people like as a rule. Mm -hmm. So, um, and her and I have had similar experiences with our with our own brothers. And she talks a lot about what her brother's been through and what she goes through still to this day. Um, and because it, it doesn't end, you know, it doesn't end. Um, 
So I would say definitely follow her. She is a, a great resource for just information all around that, um, especially with regard to LA County. And, and the reason why I, I suggest anyone in the country, you know, watch what's happening in LA County is because we are the largest and because we, c we can set a precedent um, for the rest of the nation. Um, and hopefully, you know, as, as, as California goes, so does the rest of the nation with, with regard to criminal justice. Yeah. I wonder, you and I talked earlier and um, I wanted to make sure you were comfortable talking about your brother and, and you shared that in talking to him that, that he really gave you the green light. And I, I wonder what that process has been like, because it's one thing to be vulnerable with your own story, but, but you're also, you know, you're, you're thinking not only about you, but, but your brother. And I wonder what, what that has been like to choose to share some of his life. Um, it's been, it's been hard, but I think, um, it's been really powerful. Like, like I did this one post a couple of weeks ago and it was just like, I was just being really super honest about, yeah. you know, what was going on and why I was supporting the, um, the ballot initiative at, for reform LA jails. And, um, and I r remember I was typing up that post and I was like, I need to ask him, like, I'm about to put this out to the world. I need to ask him if it's okay if I share his story. And, um, and he actually gets, he actually lights up whenever I tell him, you know, I'm like, I'm working for you, man. <laughs> I'm like yeah. advocating for you. Like, I want to make sure that what's, what you've been through, no one else has to go through ever again. And I think he really appreciates it. It's actually really healing for him um, as well, because he knows that he's not alone. I think for a lot of mentally ill people, you can't, you're so, especially if you're in the throes of your illness, you, you don't really, um, you don't really think like, oh, this is like, this is larger than me. And a lot of people are struggling with this and, um, and I can be somehow part of the solution. I think it's really powerful for, for people like him to know that. Um, so, yeah. That's awesome. I'm sure, wait, it remind me, is he big brother or little brother? Little brother. Yeah. How far apart are you guys? One year. Oh, okay. We're like, um, me, I have a brother who's a year younger and a brother who's a year older and we're like 13 months apart each. So we're like, I don't know what you call that, Irish triplets or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, do, you do you feel like, are you encouraged by the progress that's being made and, and certainly the ballot moment that you got to experience? Um, does it feel like there's reason to be hopeful in, about this topic? Yeah, I do, especially weirdly now, because what I think is happening, and I think not just with regard to criminal justice, but like the healthcare system in general. And I think you can't divorce um, our shortcomings with just like healthcare in general in this country. Sure. You can't divorce that from what's going on um, in the criminal justice system because like for instance, um, and I posted about this on my Instagram, there's this documentary on PBS called Bedlam. And it's all about this um, psychiatric hospital that uh, closed down in the 1940s and how, uh, and it was just due to like different policies under Ronald Reagan. And basically our, our healthcare system changed a lot and it changed a lot with, with Ronald Reagan and, and subsequent presidents. And it's all about like, who wants to shoulder the burden of healthcare? Who wants to shoulder the burden of people with mental illness? Um, and how, you know, the buck kept getting passed between um, states and federal and state and, and everyone going like, we don't, we don't want this burden. And um, they closed down this hospital. And then this amazing statistic that I didn't know is that the percentage of American people who are in psychiatric hospitals during that time when they closed them all down in the United States is the same percentage of Americans that are now incarcerated, wow. and mentally ill people that are now incarcerated in different, um, in different, in all over the, all in all over the nation. Yeah. So, um, so wait, I got off topic. What was I saying? So, forties bedlam. 
what you what was the initial the initial question oh are you hopeful oh yeah i'm hopeful because this pandemic is forcing us hopefully that will be the silver lining in all this is that we actually are being forced to address these issues because people are now you know the pandemic is 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 sweeping through jails all yeah. over all over this county all over like in cook county um these jails that are overcrowded and they're they're crowded with people who are awaiting trial who are not who have not been found guilty who can't afford bail because they uh violated their probation or they whatever it is um and and it's like why and and people are dying because they because yeah. they can't afford bail um and also it's it's forcing us to really look at the the discrepancies between like you know brown and not brown people in this country and and resources that they have and access that they have to health care and access that they have to um to mental health care especially yeah um so I think in a, in a weird way, there are a lot of positive things happening around it because it's just force it forcing us to go like, okay, we have to address this. Like we can't just let people die in jail. Yeah. Um, who aren't even necessarily criminals. I mean, there are innocent people in jail who are, who may die of COVID-19 hmm. because they couldn't afford bail. Yeah. And that's right. just, that's incomprehensible to me. Yeah. That, that is how that, that we're allowing that to happen. Yeah. Um, so I, so I am hopeful. I think, and I, I think if we, if we as a community and as a nation go, we won't accept this anymore. And we now, and that more people have awareness as to what's really going on and how it got to be like that and how we can undo it. I think, I do think that people will rise up and, and demand that, I hope. Yeah. No, I, I <laughs> hope so too. Will you remind people um, the organization that's in your bio? Um, it's called Reform LA Jails. And it's actually not an organization. It's a, it's a ballot committee. Okay. And, um, and so they're the people who are working on behalf of LA County voters showing up at the, at the votes, at the mm -hmm. courts going like, hey, we're here and we are advocating for, you know, our, our vulnerable people who are who are incarcerated right now and trying to change policy around policing and policy around sentencing and policy around um, uh, reintegration back into the communities after someone's, you know, been suffering with mental illness in jail for six months with no yeah. medication. Like how does that person get back into the community and get back on their feet? Um, and so, yeah, there's so much amazing work being done around that. So I encourage you to, to follow Reform LA Jails, follow Patrice Colors, follow Dignity and Power Now, Justice LA, and I can, I can send more if you want. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much. Thank you for spending this time with us. It's good to see you. I hope, it, I hope people liked it. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm- My first live. Oh yeah, your first live. Um, well, wait, before I let you go, here's one I, I think about a lot. I wonder what has the process been like, not just for you to learn about these things, but to choose to be vocal? Because I feel like, I feel like people aren't sure about rocking the boat. That, you know, it's, it can be hard to talk about difficult subjects. And I wonder maybe what your experience has been like and, and even what encouragement you might have, whether it's mental health in general, or even specific to the criminal justice system? Um, I would say, yeah, it, you do have to be brave. It takes a lot of courage to talk about this kind of stuff. But then I think about, you know, and this, and again, this may sound cheesy or cliche, but I, I do think that, you know, maybe there's a reason that I, I have been put in the situation and that I have experienced the things that I've experienced um, because um, I meant to talk about them. And mm. I do have, I do have a, a firsthand experience with some really tough stuff. And, um, and I do have a platform, however big or small to just say, Hey, like, 
this is what's going on. Look at this. And I, I am in a business where I use my voice, I use my body and I, and I tell stories and, and I have, because of what I've been through, I have a lot of stories to tell. Um, and I have the tools to tell them. So I kind of feel like it's a responsibility that I, I, do, I feel responsible in a way. And it's really hard. And sometimes I don't want to, I don't want, I don't want to think about it. I don't want to be, I don't want to put myself on blast like that. I don't want to, I don't want to be an activist. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not an activist because I want to be, I don't, I wish I didn't have these experiences. I don't, I just want to like sing and dance and make movies and, and, and be in musicals. And, you know, that's, that's yeah. my dream. Um, but this is, this is my life. This is my reality. And so, um, so I do it and you just have to be brave, but I say, you know, I don't think anything great happens, um, especially in art, um, without courage and bravery. So, um, so yeah, be brave. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Um, well, thank you. Thank you again. Thanks for, for sharing just what you've been, your, your story, your brother's story, what you've been learning. Um, I think it's important. It's, it, it's important for me to learn about and hopefully the folks watching feel that way as well. Yeah, I hope so. I hope this has been, you know, helpful to anyone yeah, listening. Totally. And if anyone has questions for me or whatever, um, you can hit me up in my DMs. Oh. Even though I've maxed out my screen time for the day, I will. I'll take questions. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. Well, hey, I'm going to let you go. Thank you again. Thanks for being my friend. Good to All see right. you. Bye, guys. Bye. All right, Megalyn Etchikin Woke, uh, please follow her. And from there, you can follow some of the great work that she's been learning about and advocating for. Um, you can definitely find her profile uh, through the To Write Love on Her Arms Instagram, or actually she's, she has an easy handle. It's at Megalyn, M-E-G-A-L-Y-N. Super honored to get to talk to her. And we're gonna bring on Carlos Whitaker now. Okay. All right, Carlos is coming. Hey. Hey. Is this a mirror? Dude, am I just the darker version of you? <laughs> um, oh man, thanks, sorry to keep you waiting. Bro, that was such a good conversation. Like um, she was, she was using words that I've never used in my life. And I'm like, what, what am I gonna, what am I gonna say? Oh, no, she's awesome. I'm glad, thanks for checking that out. How did your podcast go? Jamie FaceTimed me earlier today and I had, to, I, I don't, I don't often reject him. No, I think you texted me and I was like, bro, I'm in the podcast right now. I can't, I can't talk to you. Um, it but the okay. podcast went great. I, I had three podcasts in between then and now I've, I've been, I've been, and now doing my thing. Wait, do you want to tell people why you're so busy? Because my book's coming out in five weeks. What's uh, it called? Enter Wild. What's it about? Exchange a mild and mundane faith for life with an uncontainable God. Uh, it's it's uh, honestly, it's 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 a memoir of my faith journey the last five years. Honestly, that's what mm. it is. So I love it. It's been crazy. Yeah. Um, you, I, I know a lot of people can say this, but I will say for me, you are one of my favorite people to follow. Like I follow way too many people, but I, I think to myself, if I could only follow 10 people or even five, you would be one of them. Um, and you, I, f I also love that <clears throat> you share so many different parts of your life and so many different parts of life. Yeah. Hope is a really broad word, but I feel like you're just such a force for good. Um, and I wonder maybe as like a place to start, just what that journey has been like choosing to use <clears throat> social media to encourage people, um, choosing to use it to share the mental health part of your story yeah. and feeling the freedom to talk about faith, mental health, birds, daughters, yeah. um, just what all that has been like for you. All the things. Um, Man, you know, I think 
I mean, here's the deal. So like when I first started sharing about my mental health struggles, it was like, oh man, 19, oh no, no, it was, what was it? No, it was like 2005. Yeah. And so I was a worship leader at a church in 2005 and I'll never forget like having my very first panic attack and thinking, oh my God, like my life's falling apart. And then having people, well-meaning Christians, uh, tell me to pray harder, um, all, all the things that they, they really, you know, and I, bro, there were, there were holes in my knees because, because I was praying, I was on my knees, right? I was praying and then things weren't getting better. Mm. And, um, and, and then I just felt so alone, Jamie, like I felt, I felt so alone. And back in 2005, right? Like I had, I think I had like a, a Zanga, uh, yeah. a, a, a Zanga website. <laughs> Is that what it was called? Yeah. I never had one, but that rings a bell. Yes. Yeah. So, and I, I just remember thinking there's gotta be other people. There has to be other Christians like me that, that are crazy, right? Like they've gotta be, everyone else is calling me crazy. Like there's gotta be other people. So I started sharing my journey um, and phew, dude, it was, well, initially I'll never forget like the pushback I got from like the faith community. Like remember this is 2005, yeah. it's 15 years ago. Uh, and 2005, I started taking Paxil. And I remember like the second day I was like, I put up a picture of me like with my little Paxil thing and I, I put it on my Zanga and dude, you would have thought that I would have like, that I was committed to seven deadly sins all at one time. Like it was, it was nuts. People didn't know what to do with that, but I just knew that that's, I'm just created to share everything of who I am, the ups and the downs. Um, and I saw through that, Jamie, that so many people just started commenting, oh my gosh, you, you, like worship leader at mega church, Carlos, like you're struggling with anxiety. And I remember like, there was something inside of me that was like, I can't, I can't stop doing this. Like, I can't stop being the real guy, uh, strip, you know, strip the facade back. And so I think it started with mental health. It really did. But then, then my journey kind of continued through all my struggles. I think I've been very vulnerable with a lot of my struggles. Honestly, I, I feel like that's probably why a lot of people follow me is because because I, I show everything like I, I I let everybody see every facet of who I am. Um, and, uh, and, and, and of course, people know that mental health is is something that I am very passionate about. Obviously, um, you and I um, are friends and I, I today it's a random day. I'm not sporting your gear, but I normally am, am sporting uh, Trite Love and Arms gear and um, uh, or my or my kids are because they, they they grab a hold of all the merch before I can gra I can put it on but um man it's just so important for people to be authentic and be real and we're just I, I think people humanity in general is just tired mm. of the fluff man we're tired of the of the um filters we're tired of all that stuff we need the only thing that's going to lead somebody I think to freedom is is seeing somebody that was in chains and so for me it's it's like, hey, I'm gonna show you when I was in chains with with anxiety and depression. I'm gonna show you when I've not been. And guess what? If I go back and I'm back in it, I'm gonna show you again. You know, mm -hmm. this this is a this is a journey like this. You know, and so, yeah. man, I just love I I love I love slinging hope. I love letting people and I do it I do it um, I think in a little bit of an authentic way, yeah. um, and I think people enjoy it. Um, man, thank you for that. I I want to bounce around a little. I think that's okay. okay. But I we've been trying we've at this point, been doing these for a couple months and have had a bunch of friends on. And I love asking everyone just kind of what this season has looked like and felt like um, you are a husband, you're a dad. So I wonder, kind of through the lens of mental health, self care, uh, and I, I've obviously I follow you and I pay attention. So I've seen some posts about it. But I wonder what has this season been like for you and your family? Yeah, man, you know, it's, um, it's been uh, surprisingly, and I, I need to be careful when I say this because I know that this, I know this isn't the case for everybody. So sure. I, I know that I know that uh, this season with COVID is affecting different people in different ways. Yeah. Um, but to be blatantly honest, which is what I am with you, like I'm actually gonna be a little bit sad yeah. when when some politician somewhere tells my daughters that they can leave. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because because it's been 
such a sweet season. I, I mean, here's the deal, and I look at it this way. Um, well, it's been a sweet season for me, but also, I mean, let's let's be blunt here. My mom had coronavirus. Yeah. My mom, my mom was gravely ill, alone in Los Angeles. I'm I'm begging the whole world to help her. You know, she can't get a test. Like so, in the midst of the the chaos and the the sadness of it, it's been a sweet season for my little nuclear family here. Um, a, a lot of people know that. Follow me. In November, um, we were kind of robbed of of some time with with uh, as a family uh, when my 17 year old daughter got sick, went into the hospital and was extremely ill for 21, 22 days in the hospital. Um, and then just her being sick uh, after that for a long time, we felt like that was kind of robbed from us as a family. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, we feel like it's been given back to us. We, we feel like in this in in these last uh, how long has it been now 50 something days yeah. that we have we have taken back everything that was stolen from us mm -hmm. um and so you know that that's been our that's been that's been the way we've been handling it there has been uh seasons for or episodes uh where i will get overwhelmed yeah. um but you know i mean if anyone if if anyone's talked to me for any amount of time you know i've i've done lots of work in a therapist's office and i've got lots of tools that i am i am like i'm like plugging these things in with well no, that didn't work i'm plugging this one in and so you know, I've got my my methods to yeah. the madness that when when I when I get overwhelmed, but it's it's actually been a really um, sweet season for us. That I think my my wannabe Amish homesteading wife is going to be a little upset when uh, when it's time to get back on airplanes. Yeah, can you talk about some specifics? I know you you guys have been taking walks as a family, but just are there certain rhythms that have felt good in this time? Yeah. Oh yeah, man. We in in 18 years of having children, we've never taken daily walks together. And suddenly my wife and all three of my kids and our big fluffy dog, we go on walks every single day. And what, the funny thing is, is, you know, Sohail is actually still getting her lungs back. She's still recovering from her illness. So, you know, we're, we only walk a mile, but it takes, I mean, it takes a long time, yeah. you know? And so I think every day, you know, there's a, when it comes time for the walk, I think everyone approaches the walk, the Whitaker walk in a different way, you know, Heather's really excited about it. I'm more concerned, like how's Sohaila feeling today? Is she gonna, you know, uh, I think uh, Lasai is really excited because we get to throw the football on the walk. Um, Siana is just like, oh my God, do we have to take another freaking walk? You know, and I think, and, and I think Sohaila and Siana are probably the same. But once we get into the walk, dude, the conversations that we're having in our little, I think it was probably even half a mile, on our little loop that we take. Um, you know, even the other day, the girls were like, can we still go on walks once the pandemic's over? I was yeah. like, yeah, we can still go on walks. Yeah. You know? Oh man, that's so good. Um, yeah. I want to switch it up and talk about race. And yeah. obviously it's such an important, always, always important, but such a moment when people all across this country are thinking and talking and even wrestling and debating this issue. Um, and I wonder, maybe looking at the death of Ahmad Arbery, yeah. um, kind of how that how that hit you. And I know there's a video that you made in response. And I wonder if you could just kind of talk about um, that process of, of getting that news and choosing to respond, and, and yeah. maybe even the response to your response. Yeah, you know, um, I my demographic of people that follow me on Instagram is, at least last I checked, and th these, are, these are the people that follow me, these are the people I love, but it's like white 33 to 45 year old humans. Yeah. Um, and I feel a responsibility to, um, to have candid conversations about everything, right? Not just to you know, pick and choose. And so I feel like so many evangelical leaders they they shut up when it when it's the most important when it's the most important time to speak up. Mm. Now I don't have a I don't have a church, so maybe that's why it's a little bit easier. I'm not on staff somewhere. No one's gonna no one's gonna fire me from Instagram. Sorry, you can unfollow me, but that that's you know. Um, but but I felt I felt when especially this one, you know, um, I feel like more eyes were on it just because we're all staring at our phones. Um, yeah. More people started asking. Well, yeah, I mean that this that. That, that guy was running, he was pinned between two vehicles and, and he got shot. Um, 
that doesn't feel right. And I feel like everyone was feeling like that. This doesn't feel right um, on every spectrum. And so what, what I realized is I feel like I needed to put some language to what people were feeling um, because I know a lot of my white friends, they were tiptoeing around. I, and I was actually having a lot of conversations before I put the video out with my white friends. They're like, what do I do? How do I say, what do I say? I don't want to be a white savior. I don't want to be, you know, this and that. Um, I was like, bro, like, just say something for the love, like just say something. And, and where I think most people got, I think what most people got from the video was the fact that we don't just need to be loud in, in the loud moments. Like we don't just need to speak when the crisis hits. You know, here's the deal. Um, the day that video went viral and the day after, all my friends, my white friends, we're put, putting pictures up of Ahmad and saying, we're not gonna stand for this. And then a couple days later, um, everyone ran 2.23 miles or whatever it was. And I'm like, I'm like applauding. But now it's Tuesday or Wednesday. I don't know what day it is. Tuesday. And, and so my question is, what are you saying now? What are you saying today? What are you saying tomorrow? What are you saying in a week? What are you saying when the press cycle leaves? That's how we're going to eradicate racism uh, in our country is not just speaking up when it's loud and when there's a hashtag that you can grab onto. Um, it's gonna be so important to speak up all the time and not only speak up, but like, again, it's easy to just throw up, throw up something on Instagram and you, you may feel something that, is, that qualifies you to do that. I'm not saying that, that it's not good to do that, but I'm just saying like when, when your grandpa who's been racist his whole life uh, says the next racist thing that you've just kind of like, he's like, he's 83 years old. And you're just like, man, that's his grandpa. That's his grandpa. Well, no, like, don't let that just be grandpa. Well, Carlos, I don't want to hurt his feelings. Like, I don't want to say anything. You, you know. No, like he, he's a grown ass man. You can hurt his feelings. Um, he'll, you know, he, it, it may cause some turmoil, but can I tell you what that's going to do? Even more so than speaking up when you see racism, being spoken around your racist tendencies or ideals but what it does as opposed to for the other person it does something for you and it rise, raises something inside of you and so the more you speak out the more these things rise up inside of you i'm telling you it's going to be easier and easier for you to call things out when you see it i I'm, i feel like the freaking racism police on my facebook feed with all my friends that are like saying like well you know the, the day after we just need to wait for the facts to see what really can like can you, for the love, like take some, is, is there an Enneagram test for, for like having any sort of like uh, common sense? Yeah. Like, is there a common, common sense personality test? Like now is not the time, you know, like now is not the time. So, you know, I'm, I'm having conversations with all my friends and they're wondering why people are calling them racist. And I'm, you know, so I feel blessed that I have so many friends. Um, honestly, most of my friends are white and, and I, I, I feel, blessed but I also feel an obligation to uh, to talk to him about it let me I'll, I'll i'll tell you this when i grew up like my dad he's half black excuse me he's fully black my my but he's from panama so he spoke spanish right so he's a black panamanian um my mom is from mexico but she's completely white like her she's 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 fair skinned like you um people were are like when i when we grew, when i was growing up my friends would because my dad spoke spanish they didn't see me as black, right? right? So they're like, well, no, you're you're Hispanic because your dad, and I was like, well, yeah, I am Hispanic, but I'm also black. Well, no, no, you're not black. Like, you're not black, black. Some, some friends would say that, like, black, black. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, I, I'm glad that like you have the, um, the opportunity to decide what I am to you. But what I can tell you is that to, to anyone that doesn't know me, I'm black. Like, yeah. that, I, I don't get to pick. I don't get to put on my, no, I'm Panamanian. You know, yeah. like, no, like I'm just a black man in America. Um, and, and so like, as, as like growing up that way, I feel like I, I have, and because we, I grew up like in, in, uh, when we moved to Atlanta, my parents moved me to Atlanta from East LA, they moved us out of the barrio into a nice affluent suburban white neighborhood. Um, all my friends, that's just where all my friends were. And so the, the, the most telling thing for me, the last few, maybe the last three years when kind of, as one of my friends put it. Uh, Carlos, your blackness is really loud these days. Um, well, how, how come you never really talked about being black until the last three years? Well, to be honest with you, I haven't had to be as loud, uh, honestly, un until 
until like white supremacy got louder. Well, guess what? Suddenly I've got to get louder. And then it actually made a lot of my friends uncomfortable. They started saying like, I, I, just, I don't see you as black, Carlos. Like, I don't, you know, like you're, you're just Carlos. Like you're one of my best friends. I'm like, again, I'm glad that you've been afforded the opportunity to not see me as black, but I get to exist in this skin color. And in, there's a climate in America that I, I'll just be honest with you. This is, you can't argue my story. You can argue statistics all you want. But my story will tell you that the last three or four years in this country, um, racism in my story has exploded. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I get to talk about it and I'm gonna talk about it. And I'm, I'm hoping to do it with kindness, with compassion, uh, and hopefully in a way that, that, that really helps people. Cause that's what I wanna do. Can, can we, we're gonna get cut off cause it's an hour since I started, but can we come right back on? Is that okay? Let's do it. All right. So we're gonna end this. We're gonna jump right back on. Okay. We are back. I'm gonna add Carlos. I'm gonna look for him now. Oh, let's see. Oh, thank you guys for coming back. This is a long one, but I believe it's a good one. Okay. In. Hey, hey. Yeah. Thank you, man. Yeah. Um, so I want to I want to kind of point out and acknowledge and also get your thoughts on how that intersects, how everything you just talked about, race, um, identity, how it relates to mental health. Yeah. Um, you are, I think we both run in a couple different circles, but you, you spent a lot of time in churches, you were a worship leader previously. So you're, you're sort of like a professional Christian, right? Yeah, I am. I, I've got, um, I'm, I'm a card carrying member of the professional Christians of America. Yeah. And I, you know, I founded a mental health nonprofit. And so I know I get told, Hey, stick to mental health. And yeah. I'm sure to in whatever language you get asked not to rock the boat. Yeah. Um, and I've come to believe I've kind of, I don't know, th this idea came to me that to care about people has to mean caring about the things that affect people, right? So if I talk about mental health, I don't get much pushback. It's not, it's not super polarizing. Yeah, and yeah. I joke, if I go to a suicide prevention <clears throat> event, no one's protesting, Sure. <laughs> right? But, but if we talk about how mental health relates to gun violence or immigration, yeah. Um, or racism, it, it's suddenly a much more charged yeah. conversation. And uh, I don't know, I just wonder your thoughts on choosing to be vocal, like even if it's yeah. not popular at times, even if it's misunderstood, um, just any thoughts kind of in that regard? Yeah, you know, I think, I think again, I'm just, I'm just getting old now. So like, as I get old, older, I kind of just stopped caring like like what people what people think right and so like there used to be a whole lot more gives a damn on my shoulders about what people think than there is now um but also i feel like i when i do talk about this stuff i feel like i'm able to come at it um from a from a space okay so let's talk about racism for a second like i'm i'm, I'm coming from race like when i talk about racism i'm coming to it from two angles uh the first angle is is like a faith angle of, of race and race relations. And the second angle, let's say, is a, a mental health angle or something. The, the reason why I feel like people are okay with me talking, saying harder things, is because I'm, I'm gonna be the first person that realizes that the reason a person is racist, and I'll say this out loud, the reason a person is racist is because they have a wound inside their heart. And that wound inside their heart, they're medicating that wound by lowering another human being so that they feel higher. So like any psychologist would tell you this, any therapist would tell you this, like, like that's just a broken human um, trying to medicate. Some people medicate with alcohol. Some people medicate with drugs. Some people medicate with sex. Some people medicate with racism. And so when I see a racist person, I actually don't, um, like I don't look down on them because they're just medicating their wound in a different way than I medicated my wound. Now, now um, 
I, so I, I feel like people see a sense of compassion in me when I, when I do talk about this. Um, like I'm not like, like hurling insults at the person with racist tendencies. Yeah. Um, and so again, this is, when we're talking about wounds, we're talking about mental health. We're, I mean, all of this stuff is connected. It's a very intricate conversation. This isn't just A plus B equals C. Um, but again, like, I feel like it's my, like, it's my role and my job. Honestly, if I could find some, and I have found some, some, some racist people that I can build a, a bridge with, build a connection with, allow them to see things the way that I see, um, and take the stigma off the word racism. Like, like that, that's one of the biggest goals for me. Like racist, is, it's a slur right now. So if you call someone racist, suddenly it, that's, a slur, that's an insult. But what I would love to do is rewind, um, take the slur off of racist and, and redefine racist. Um, and so racist isn't, a, isn't who somebody is. Racist is an action that somebody does. And so I think when we can, when we can remove the slur, so no, no longer when you say that person's a racist, well, you're actually not talking about the person, you're talking about an action or an ideal that that person is doing. And I think when we can get, and that's hard, but when we can get to that space, suddenly now we can all start realizing that we all have racist tendencies and we have racist moments, but that doesn't make us racist. True. And so, you know, like that's, a, a, again, a very nuanced conversation. There, there's a, a book that I recommend, I, I talked about it with you earlier, um, by Ibram Kendi called How to Be an Anti-Racist. And uh, this book, you know, it's, it's really changed the fabric of, of how I approach this conversation. It's no longer good enough in America to be not racist. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it's 2020, you can't just say, I'm not racist anymore. You actually have to be anti-racist, which means you have to speak up, you have to be proactive, you have to do things in order to fight against any, uh, uh, policies or systematic policies that are that are helping racist agendas continue you know and so suddenly it's like wow man i don't know if, i don't find that much time yeah i don't know if i have that much energy right to like be anti-racist it's like well yeah guess what that's where you're gonna have to go now so you can't be lazy anymore in 2020 in america with um with fighting racism you have to be anti-racist you have to vote against racist racist policies you have to vote against racist people. You have to um, uh, talk to your racist friends. You have to you have to do all sorts of things um, to be proactive in this. And so, again, uh, going back to your original question, I just think that mental health, um, racist people, excuse me, people that have racist tendencies. I'm trying to trying to use yeah. my definition here. Um, they honestly, they need therapy. Like they need they need to. Um, um, help fix and sink their hearts and fix the wound that has happened. And most of these wounds, again, they're happening in childhood. I and mean, we, we all know this if we've been in therapy, you know, we, we, when we're dealing with things, most of this stuff is happening in childhood. And so there's, and I've seen it happen. There's something I've got many friends that I've seen this happen with. Um, there's something that, that can snap and that can break. Um, and, and also there's something that can be put back together that literally can, can make racist tendencies disappear. I had a friend in college, listen to this. I went to college in the South and I was, I was in school for maybe five days before there was a bang on my door in my dormitory room. I opened it and there was a burning cross outside of my dorm room, like, like in the hallway. Um, and the same guy that did that, the guy that did that is now this was 20 years ago, is now one of my closest friends and one of the most anti-racist people I know because he's fighting against it. And, and, and what, what, what helped was it, did he change because I was screaming on the internet or did he change because I was whispering in his ear? Well, it's because I was whispering in his ear, you know? So. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I feel like you would agree that um, so many people fear what's foreign to them, right? Or, or or what they don't understand, or or they they yes. don't have a personal experience. It's based on, you know, my grandfather taught my father, my father taught me, and I feel like what part of what you're getting at is is the real humanity. Like if we could 
and this relates outside of race. I mean, this relates to mental health as well. Like if you could have a friend and do some life with them, yes, you're go It's gonna, it takes it out of the hypothetical, right? And it takes yeah. it out of just the realm of fear. And all of a sudden it's like, that's, that's a person, like that's a yeah. whole person who you could get to know. Yeah. Um, uh, what what was it like? I mean, I know you shared this video. It's it's longer, isn't it? Like eight or yeah. ten minutes. Yeah, it's like it's a long one, bro. It's like it's like eight minutes. I loved it. I know in today's world that's so long. It's like a feature film. It is, dude. Um, no, I watched it. I loved it. I shared it. I wonder for you, what were you? Was that vulnerable to put it out there? Were you were you nervous? Were you surprised by the response? Yeah, I think I was a little surprised by the response again I, w I i was just upstairs having this conversation the same conversation um i talked about in the video and you guys can watch this on my igtv video on my igtv channel but heather and i were having a conversation about it i walked downstairs i was i think i was going to the garage to get something and i saw like my lights on at my desk because i filmed something for something earlier and the camera was on and i thought i'm just gonna sit down for a second and just like vomit word vomit yeah um so i i did i talked I, I probably talked for 10 minutes and then i edited it down to seven I put it on IGTV thinking, I don't know, maybe 2,000 people will see it. I'll have 120 likes and honestly, seven comments. Yeah. Um, because people just, people don't like to talk about that stuff. And, you know, two days later, I had 100,000 views, uh, over 1,000 comments. You know, people were sharing it all over the place. Um, and it surprised me. It really did. And, and um, again, I think it was a perfect storm. But I also think that people, people are ready to do more. I, I feel like people are ready to do more. And I, I've been so encouraged by so many of my white brothers and sisters doing more. I feel like they're doing more. I feel like they're, they're not just letting it be a hashtag that they, that they tweeted or Instagrammed, that it's, it's, become, it's becoming part of the fabric of, of their DNA. And, um, you know, I got a lot, of, uh, a lot of DMs from people going, honestly, I never thought that I was racist. Mm -hmm. And listening to what you said, like, there's no action behind I've realized that there has to be action. Um, we, I, we can no longer just not be racist and be lazy. And so, you know, again, like I just was encouraged by the people that were saying this, people that I've known a long time. Yeah. Um, and uh, I had a friend of mine say, you know, that he posted something on, again, uh, well, on Facebook that he was called a racist because he posted a different point of view. And again, uh, again, at the end of the day, like timing people, like just be, be a good common sense human and, and just know if, someone just got a like a scab ripped open a wound ripped open and you know that alcohol possibly is needed to um again i'm no doctor here but but to disinfect the wound um the you're what you're not going to do is sprint up to them the second they're they're like bleeding and open and just start dumping alcohol on it because it's gonna it's gonna hurt it's gonna wound them um and there's a there's a time and a place for everything and so there's going to be a time and a place for people that have a different viewpoint on what happened with the Mod Arbery um, to speak on that. Um, and honestly, I think they should. I think they should be allowed to have, you know, to have their point of view and to speak on it as well. I'm not going to agree with everything they say. Um, but if you want to be a good human more than anything, just don't say anything unless you're going to say something that is building hope into the community that's wounded. And if, if what you say, what you're about to say, is going to rip rip a wound wide open, then don't say it. Just don't say it. It's not worth it. Yeah. I wonder in general, because I feel like I want to learn this from you. Um, you know, Megalyn talked about her activism comes from anger. Yeah. And I think so many of us can relate to that. You know, I, as I've be started to speak up about issues that aren't specifically mental health, maybe they intersect mental health. Yeah. So often I feel my anger and, and that can so easily be directed at other people it's, yeah. and obviously at other points of view. And I wonder how it would be too simple to say, how do you keep it positive? But I feel like you're able to balance, you're able to communicate in a way that remains compassionate, even when you talk about hard things or even when you might disagree with someone. And I yeah. wonder how, how have you gotten there or what, what advice might you have yeah. as, as people kind of dip their toe into the idea of speaking up yeah i i think that <clears throat> one thing that's really helped me is knowing 
I don't have this data and I'm not a statistician, but I'm fairly convinced that nobody ever changed their mind over a polarizing topic via a comment or an Instagram post. So knowing that's the case, no matter how angry and how much vitriol comes out of me, I'm not going to move the needle at all with anyone when I'm doing that. If anything, what I'm gonna do is further polarize the people that I'm trying to understand, to get to understand me. And also, but the reason why we do it is all, it also feels good. It feels good um, to get the, the pats on the back and the feedback of like, oh yeah, you gave it to them, this and that. And so again, I just think this is my old age. I, I'm just getting to the place where I, I realize, okay, what can I do to bring people together? What can I do to unify people? What can I do? Uh, you know, I, I, and I love that, honestly, like my Instagram audience, I actually did a very um, non-professional uh, poll once, but my, my Instagram audience is pretty much split down the line, uh, liberal conservative, like it is, it is, but we're all watching the Robins uh, on my Instagram channel together. We're all watching me rescue butterflies. We're all, because here's the deal, Jamie, I think, I, and this is what I honestly believe, I think people are exhausted. They're exhausted of hating each other. And, and we, want to, we want to be together. And I, may, you may call me naive, but I honestly believe there is, there's a future where, it's, where we're gonna see in this country, people with polarizing views and opposite views actually be able to not only um, stand each other, but live in harmony together. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I feel like, like that may be my job. That may be my job, to, and I may not see it. Maybe my great, 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 great grandkids will see it, but maybe they can say, oh, my great, great, great grandpa, Low Sweat on Instagram. He was bringing people together instead of tearing people apart. You know, maybe there'll be a movie about me one day in my Instagram, uh, Unity, Bridge yeah. Building. But again, I just feel like, like I can do more good when I bring people together. Even if I'm talking about something hard, make sure that I'm doing it in a way that's not driving people away, but making people, if there's one compliment that I love to get uh, from people in my DMs, it's, Carlos, I don't always agree with you, but I sure love following you. That What that shows is that I'm voicing polarizing um, opinions, yet in a way that's not repelling people. Yeah. And I, I think the more, the better we can get at that, the further we're going to get. Oh. That's so good. Um, our buddy Jake commented a while ago, and he just asked, who are the people that have inspired you? I, th I think even specific to kind of what you're, you referenced a book. Um, yeah. Who are the people that, that you look to that have taught you whether you know them or not as it relates to this conversation? Yeah, um, I think a few. Um, I think every, uh, every white guy's favorite black rapper propaganda um, you know, he, he's, he has, he's probably the smartest human being I know. He is so brilliant. And I love prop in the way that he um, can articulate things um, in ways that, that nobody else can. Yeah. Prop, props been somebody that's helped, but then somebody that maybe a lot of people don't know is Latasha Morrison. Um, she's got an organization called Be The Bridge or Build The Bridge um, that she is doing, I'm telling you, She's doing the work at the front lines with this. She's got racial reconciliation roundtables happening all across this country, like for the sole purpose of getting people that view race in different ways together around a table to have these conversations. Again, it goes back to what I said earlier, instead of shouting over Instagram, whispering in their ear, and these yeah. whispers are happening around tables. So Latasha, be the bridge, there it is, Rach, thanks for uh, putting that in the comments. What's her last um, name? Uh, Morrison. Oh, Latasha there Morrison. It is. Latasha Morrison. At Latasha Morrison. She is so kind. I, I think she's somebody else, honestly, Jamie, that may remind you of how I deal with this situation. She is, she's so inviting to people that may not um, see race relations as, as she does, but I feel like people feel like she's safe enough to listen to. So she's somebody that I would recommend everybody go to. Yeah. Um, man, that's so good. Well, I think we're going to leave it here, but I'm, I'm grateful. Obviously I'm grateful to know you, but just thank you for your time today. Yeah, dude. Love you. And uh, yeah, yeah I just you. such a fan of yours and, and just thankful that I get to be your friend. Yeah. Love you too. And everybody, everybody that came from my channel over here, 
Make sure that Jamie's not on here, but Jamie Torkowski, you can't spell his name without Googling it and messing it up. But once you find it, follow Jamie, follow the right well, love I, in your arms. Huh. I was just going to say, I only learned, I mean, I consider you a good friend. I only learned the real spelling of your last name this week. This week, I've got two T's, not just one. Just two thought T's. it was, and that's the less common way of spelling Whitaker, right? Yes, two T's, we're a very rare, rare breed. Uh, one T's are everywhere. Two T's are very, Forrest Whitaker, one T. You know, like, like all the old all the, two T's were very, you know. Also, to write Love in Our Arms, uh, incredible nonprofit. Donate all your extra money to them. They, they, are, <laughs> they do incredible stuff. Oh, uh, wait, it was, thank you for that. Um, it was funny because we were, we were on Slack and it was, I was working with some of our team and I pointed out, I said, hey, Meg, Megalyn's name is hard to spell. <laughs> she just commented. I said, let's make sure we spell Megalyn's name correctly. Megalyn. And in doing that, I spelled your last name wrong. Oh. So my sister Jessica pointed out, hey, this is actually how Carlos's last <laughs> name is spelled. Look, look, Megalyn said, how about my last name on the, oh, in the comments? Oh, can Woke. It's legit. <laughs> I'm not even going to try, Megalyn, to spell that. But I did start following you right before this. So I'm excited to do that. Yeah, she's awesome. Well, man, thank you so much. And uh, I hope... Hopefully we can hang out in your front yard or my front yard soon. Please, let's get the dogs together. Uh, Jess says she has, has your back. Uh, thanks, Jessica. Well, man, I'm, I'm going to let you go. Thank you again, and I'll talk to you soon. Love you, man. See ya. All right. If you're still here, thank you for being with us. This was a long one, but I, I really believe it was an important one. Thank you to Megalyn. Thank you to Carlos. Please follow both of them at Megalyn and at Los Wit. Carlos, uh, yeah, Carlos is, is wonderful. It's like watching a reality television show, but in a good way. Following him, you get just such a cool window into not only his life, but his, his life as a, as a husband and a dad. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I've, I've been learning a lot from Megalyn about really this intersection of mental health and the criminal justice system. And so I'm hopeful that, that you guys will be interested and learn from these two as well. And just to recap some of the announcements that we started with, Run For It 5K is coming up this weekend, Saturday, May 16th. I have the shirt on, I will show you again. Forward is forward no matter the pace. You can still order a t-shirt, even if it gets there after this weekend, it's okay. Uh, if you end up running or walking next week, that's totally okay. We are going to have close to 4,000 people participating, which is incredible. Biggest year we've ever had, even with the gathering in Florida having to be canceled. We are amazed that so many people all across America and around the world want to be part of this. You can learn more, runforit5k.com. And again, the hashtag, which we would invite you to use is hashtag runforit5k. We are closing in on our goal of raising $85,000. So we are right around $6,000 away. Thank you to our fundraisers. Thank you to people donating. If you want to participate, again, it's not too late. Uh, new podcast episode today. You can find that through the website. I uh, want to mention and say thank you to anyone who has donated their birthday on Facebook. That has become one of our biggest sources of financial support is people turning their birthday into a fundraising opportunity for the organization. And so we have just been so amazed and impressed and we are so grateful. So thank you. Also, if you want to do that, you can learn more about it on our website. Uh, if someone from our team wants to put that link in a comment, uh, that would be helpful. Mental Health Awareness Month is this month of May. AFSP is hosting a Twitter chat tomorrow, Wednesday, 2 p.m. Eastern. We're going to be a part of that along with a bunch of other great organizations. We're going to do this again, Toloha at Home, next Tuesday, same time, 4 p.m. Eastern. That is Tuesday, May 19th. And then I will be live on Skull Candy's Instagram the evening of Thursday, May 21st. So next Thursday, probably seven Eastern, but we'll let you know when we nail that down. Uh, the documentary that Megalyn 
mention it's actually six parts on netflix it's called basketball or nothing so please check that out uh and just always try to say this i didn't say it at the beginning but want to say it here we know this is a hard time for a lot of people we know that people are grieving we know people are concerned about sick friends or family members we know that people are out of work struggling to pay bills and so we just want to encourage you that you are not alone um, that we are in this together and we don't know what a month from now or a year from now looks like uh, we're going to keep going one day at a time i mentioned our website resources mental health resources but also covid19 related resources that are available um, everything from financial resources to food but then again back to mental health if you need to see a counselor if you need to step into treatment you can still do that in this time and if you go to our find help tool top right corner of our website if you enter your zip code you can find and connect with local mental health resources in your area and so that's something we are so proud to be able to offer gracie come here hey come here come here come here she's trying to get gracie to come sign off with me she's she's boycotting she's on the other couch uh oh if Jess, if you could post the link for anyone curious about donating their birthday on Facebook. And my sister's going to share that as a comment, but please be encouraged. We know it's a hard time. We know it's an uncertain time. A lot of people dealing with anxiety uh, one day at a time, and it's okay. It's even more than okay. Please reach out to loved ones, FaceTime, phone call, a lot of people on Zoom at the moment. Crisis Text Line is a resource we love to point to. They are available around the clock. In the US, you simply send a text to 741-741. You'll get a response from a trained crisis counselor. And Jess posted the link to aloha.com slash birthday. So if you're curious about donating your birthday or using your birthday to raise funds for To Write Love on Our Arms, aloha.com slash birthday is the place to do it. So thank you for spending an hour and a half with us. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you again to Megalyn and Carlos. And we will see you back one week from today, next Tuesday. You guys stay safe, stay healthy, take care. Thanks again.